right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming to the very last session room in the building here on the very south end. I uh, have never been in a, a conference center this big in my life. Uh, so this is, I'm getting all my steps in, by the way. My family is watching my Fitbit count every day, and uh, they're saying, good job, Dad. Uh, great to get all those steps in. So um, thank you for taking the time to come here this afternoon and learn a little bit about how we're using Tableau in our uh, global corporate treasury. So uh, my name is Ed Berry. I'm Senior Director of Treasury at Tableau, and I'm responsible for the treasury function uh, globally. We're centrally, uh, our group is, and team is uh, at our corporate headquarters in Seattle, and we get to deal with a lot of different things here that we're gonna, t some of these we're gonna touch on today. So if you're not interested in treasury, which is, by the way, a very riveting subject, uh, feel free to escape. Uh, there's a couple of other related sessions uh, going on tomorrow. Uh, there's a great talk by uh, our team on how we manage IT finances at Tableau. And then the Treasury discussion wouldn't be complete unless we mentioned something about uh, market risk and trading floor. So there should be a good session uh, done by Scotiabank. Uh, so if anybody's not familiar with Treasury, uh, this is um, it's really a, a great intersection to be for any company. It's uh, something I've been involved with for about 17 years now. Uh, this is the third company I've been at, third public company uh, in, tr in corporate treasury. So we're really the central bank of the organization and it's a great nexus spot to be in where you see the aspects of the business and the products, the different business units, uh, technology, capital markets, banking, payments, and it's kind of that intersection of all of those things. So it's really a fun and interesting spot to be in. It's one that I enjoy and uh, that I'm very passionate about. My wife would tell you I'm probably overpassionate about it based on the stack of paper on my nightstand at home, uh, on all the different articles and journals that I'm kind of reading on the subject. And so what do we do at Tableau? We really help our, uh, the company grow by <clears throat> putting in the financial transaction infrastructure that our business groups need and the company needs, and then we manage the, and mitigate risks around that. So we get to deal with a lot of different touch points. And one thing I just wanna also say is I love questions, so feel free to raise hands. And there's, uh, don't hold back on questions. It makes it a much more uh, fun and interactive session. So some of the things that we do, we manage all of our banking relationships. And if you're in the treasury space or the banking space or anywhere along the line, you know there's a never ending aspect of uh, what's called KYC, know your client, and a money laundering. Uh, and other regulatory requirements. And so that takes a lot of data to manage that and a lot of paper. We're also responsible for our payment processing. So it's how we uh, optimize and manage payments outbound, how we pay our suppliers, our employees, and how we also collect from customers. So receipt processing and optimization, how we drive liquidity management, including cash forecasting for the company and our subsidiary funding. Uh, we also manage our investments, so how we invest excess cash for the company, trying to earn a little bit more, which is a great spot to be in now, uh, depending on your view and rising interest rates. Uh, so it's a very important aspect for, for our treasury function. We also manage our foreign exchange, so how we mitigate and manage uh, FX exposure risks for the company. We also uh, lead our e-commerce efforts, so how we take payments via cards and share repurchase program. So Tableau periodically buys back its uh, shares in the uh, public markets. And we also manage whatever else gets put on our plate on a daily basis. So our, my colleagues in the back here can say, there's never a surprise, never a dull day at Tableau because you never know what's gonna end up on your plate and what you're gonna be working on. So today we're just gonna cover a few things uh, around cash management, so how we've kind of removed friction uh, and drive analytics of our cash and, and banking operations. Uh, payments, so, so this is some newer capabilities that we've just started rolling out and, and the developing and around uh, payments management, payments optimization, and really compliance and risk management around that. Uh, and then we'll do a little, uh, show you a little bit how we're using data to manage our corporate card program. So how our employees are using cards and handle we manage uh, compliance and, and different aspects. We'll touch on some treasury trends to watch and uh, maybe some key messages. And I love questions and answers, so please ask lots of questions. 
So uh, one of the questions that comes up is how do you manage and mitigate risk? And I would say data, lots of data. And you'll hear me talk about this several times in the presentation today, data at the transaction level. So anything less than transaction level, which is at the lowest level, it's hard to then distill down what's driving certain things or what's uh, causing outcomes. So we really are interested in data at that level. So transparency, give me the data that I need to understand our risks, people, so allowing the team to build the analytics that they need, that our team needs to manage this for the company. Process, so really how we develop flexible workflows and moving our team from fixed workflows or static workflows to flexible workflows. Uh, systems, so giving the tools uh, that also capture the data. And data, more data, lots of data. Uh, so. In my time in Treasury, really for the last 17 years, I've seen this shift in the function from moving for, from really kind of traditional financial analytics, rate of return analysis, uh, uh, risk uh, management, to really systems and data. And I would say the aspect of my job is completely flipped. So I used to spend maybe 10, 20% of my time on systems and data and technology. Now I spend about 80%. So it's a huge, uh, a sh huge shift and something that I hear over and over again when I go to treasury conferences, talk with peers at other companies, and what are they struggling with? So what about all that data? I had a really good discussion with a customer of uh, Tableau's this morning who's actually in the session here. And he asked the question, how do I start? How do I think about using Tableau? Uh, and I thought about that. I thought, that's a great question. And I kind of look back on my journey. So having been at Tableau, coming up on my three-year anniversary, I had not used the product until right before I started at Tableau. It's actually part of the interview process that you download tab a trial license of Tableau and try and build something with it. And so I actually downloaded a copy, was able to attach to a SQL database that was the back end for a treasury management system we were using at my previous company. And I was actually able to produce, literally produce reports or some, uh, build a dashboard in less than an hour. Uh, and so that was you know, really, really uh, impactful for me. And I was, generated excitement thing, man, I might be able to use this going forward, but the question this morning is, where do you start? So this next diagram is not meant to scare you or make you run out of the room uh, or overwhelm you, but the way this started at Tableau is I was, came to Tableau and I said, what are all the systems that we have that lead to a cash flow against a bank account at some point in time? And so I looked at this and I said, wow, there's a lot of systems out there, a lot of data sources, and so I started kind of building this schematic out, and this actually is three years in the works now, because I keep adding d different, uh, different uh, bullet points to it, but I was really thinking about, you know, how, how am I going to source data to just get, a, you know, understand our cash position, understand our short-term cash flow ca forecast, and wh what are all the other systems that, and data sources that have data that I can actually use within the job here in, in the function? And then as this thing grew and I started getting feedback from people, we started uh, iterating through this and saying, okay, well, let's kind of organize this in swim lanes from ERP systems to planning systems, what are traditional kind of data sources that a treasury uses, say, for balance sheet uh, accounts from the GL or income statement, payments, supplier data, beneficiary bank data, and kind of work your way down through these different things and, you know, all the way down to... Uh, procurement systems, uh, conference and event management systems. So even the registrations that we do for Tableau Conference, I mean, there's data in there that ultimately leads to a cash flow against our uh, bank account at some point in time. And then you think about how do I start linking that in with market data? And that's a whole other universe, thinking about third parties like Bloomberg or Thomson Reuters or different data attributes, whether it's money market fund yields or fixed income yields and rates, uh, benchmark rates, things like that. So it's just kind of working the way th through uh, from left to right, HR data, tax data, thinking about insurance, uh, merchant services, or e-commerce and the different providers that are in there, foreign exchange, uh, corporate card programs, investments, uh, you know, a lot of emerging technologies out there, thinking about th things like SWIFT, uh, banking data on statements or payments, payment status reports. 
So that, and this landscape is always evolving. It's always changing. New providers coming in, formats changing, regulatory changes. And so all of this is leading to different data, uh, different use of data, and, um, and really growing ocean of data. So the next slide here, and I don't know if the color coding will come through. So the color coding, green is really a third party system or service that we use at Tableau, and red is data that we use. So every company that's in here is gonna fit somewhere on this schematic in terms of the different systems you might use or sources. And this is not to be obviously all inclusive, but it's really just a roadmap. So thinking through, you know, how, did I start, how do we start with that? And the, question, and the question I was trying to get to on my first week at Tableau is, what's our cash position? What are all of our bank accounts? What's the composition of uh, cash by currency, by subsidiary, by bank partner? And just kind of working through that. And so really using that as, as, a, uh, as a kind of a roadmap, as it were, to, to drive to that. Any questions so far? Please feel free to ask. Okay, so this is uh, another attempt at a Visio a diagram. Um, and this is really talking about how we connect with our different banking partners around the world. We are a corporate participant on the SWIFT financial messaging network, and that's really to standardize how we communicate with our banking partners around the world. And they're all pushing data to us, end of day statements, image files, month end statements, daily statements, status reports, there's a whole uh, billing statements, all sorts of different things. And ultimately all that comes down and a lot of it goes into what we call our financial master data warehouse, which is a kind of a catch all term at Tableau because it's primarily, it initially started out as a SQL server database and it really started out as a copy of our ERP system. And it's evolved to have many other data sources and then it's actually evolved to be not just SQL Server, but our stuff in Treasury, a lot of it's hosted on AWS Redshift. And now we're actually moving some of that or porting it to the Snowflake uh, cloud uh, database. So our technology teams are always kind of playing with that and making sure that you know, we're staying on the leading edge of, of the different databases um, and hosting types out there. So we have a couple of other systems that we're obviously leveraging data from our NetSuite ERP system. We use an a invoice capture system called Coupa. It's a cloud-based kind of workflow, purchase order management, and, uh, invoice capture system. And so there's just pockets of data that are coming through there. And the one thing you'll see down here is treasury management system. So there's actually nothing there right now. And for, for a reason, what we've been doing is kind of, I wouldn't say intentionally building our own but in my experience, there's a ton of cost and effort and expense on integrating data, and we're really trying to move away from that model. So instead of doing the traditional extract data from this system, shoehorn it into another system, and when I do that shoehorning in, I'm never quite happy with the data because I have to chop things off or I don't have the fidelity that I need, and really I'm just trying to get a piece of data to put into a calculation or to put into some sort of analysis. So we're really trying to move away from that. So what we initially built here is what we call our bank statement database. So connecting with our banks over SWIFT, we also have some legacy FTP connectivity, and we bring down statements in the legacy, what's called BAI2 format, the 30-year-old format. It's not changing anymore. It's limited in the fidelity of data that's, a, uh, that's represented in that. Uh, and limited, and we're also uh, receiving what's called the CAMT053, which is a next generation statement format based on XML. So if any of you are in the banking world or payments world, you've probably heard of ISO 2022 XML, and that's the kind of the next generation standard. And when they say generation, that really is true, generation being 20, 25 years in the making or <laughs> duration. So I, my first job, in Treasury back in the um, early 2000s, ISO 2022 was just coming out, and now it's starting to get, you know, 15 years later, broader adoption. So it's really, the, there's a long life cycle of these formats uh, in being cr created and then actually being used in the, in, the, in the production world. 
And so, and our preference is to get the, the CAMT end of day statement because we want more data. We want to get more uh, attributes of data and understanding our transaction flows that are coming through there. So we take the data, we bring it into the database, import it twice a day. We actually use Alteryx to map that data, those source statements into uh, Redshift and we sit Tableau on top of that. So that gives us really nearly 100% visibility to our daily cash balances and transactions at the account level. Uh, we have a couple of accounts that don't report in because they have de minimis activity uh, with them. And it really acts as a central source of truth for all of our banking data and it's something that's used across the company. And that's allowed us to reduce the usage of banking portals that are out there. And so this was just a quick dashboard that we built to show the different data elements, whether there's duplicate statements. And you can see this was from early testing data uh, while we were working out some of the logic. And then the data elements provided by different banks on different formats. And so just kind of looking at different attributes there of those statements. But another way to think about that is actually taking the data then and saying, what is our balances by currency uh, over time? What are major changes in those currency balances? And uh, understanding you know, where are we at in terms of that composition of cash. And so being able to drill into the outs, uh, outliers that are out there and understand uh, what's driving these things. So just lots of, you know, some of these things we don't necessarily use every day. We're just, we, one of the things at Tableau that we're kind of, ex we are expected to do is use our own product and kind of d design different analysis. So sometimes we'll just start playing around and say, where does this lead to? Uh, where does it take us? So we talk a lot about Tableau being data visualization. I also think about it in terms of driving integrity and analytics of data. So this was uh, something we put together. We actually identified that we were missing some statements uh, last year, the year before. And so we actually built this formula out here, this analysis to look by month, look at the opening ledger balance of the first, very first statement received for the period, uh, take the closing ledger balance for the very last statement of the period or by month. We actually do a math formula on it. So we take the opening ledger balance plus the sum of all credit transactions. So now we're taking kind of two different components of a statement balance level data and transaction level data. And so we're adding up the credit transactions, subtracting out debit transactions, subtracting the closing ledger balance. And the most important number on here is zero, which is the balance check. And so anything other than zero means that we're either missing data or we have a problem with the data. And so we've actually identified statements that we're getting that had erroneous or miscalculated data in it. And then we have another kind of sub dashboard that gets published every day and it highlights if there's any issues out there for an account. So we have you know, dozens and dozens of bank accounts. We don't want to filter through this report every day, but we can subscribe to it and just see those that uh, drop out uh, that indicate an issue. And thankfully, it's very rare that we have an issue. And we can look at this both in account currency as well as US dollar equivalent. So this is really gives our accounting team, who's also using this data, comfort that we're monitoring the data and that we're getting all the right statements because they're driving the actual accounting entries into our ERP system. So I think about not just visualization of lots of data, but how do we actually take it down into things like data integrity and data management. So getting into transaction level data, you know, some of the things you can do when you take thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of transactions and roll them up and understanding what does that mean from a cash, uh, cash flow perspective. And so by understanding the transaction level data, we do things like filtering out, uh, the in the banking world, we have uh, what are called ZBA sweeps, zero balance account sweeps, which are automated cash movements between accounts of the same legal entity. So filtering those out so we don't gross up our flows, right? So just kind of thinking about what's a true third party transaction and then how do we understand what are some of the drivers there of that data? And then, you know, very, you know, traditional type of uh, bar chart there. I'm a, I, I will readily admit I'm a 35-year Excel user, so it's hard to break away from that. <laughs> What's the most common treasury management system out there? Excel. Uh, so, which is true. I'm hoping to shift that to make it Tableau, so I hope I've given you tools today to think about using Tableau in your uh, treasury or finance function. 
because truly you can do things uh, in a much uh, easier way uh, and really explore your data and different attributes of it. So this is a kind of another variation of a uh, kind of a waterfall uh, chart at a weekly level, kind of looking at changes in cash. So just you know, playing around with different, different views of that data, uh, the transaction level data. And then really taking this out to kind of a heat map where we're actually looking at transaction types, uh, transaction codes, if you're familiar with those from bank statements. And then for the time period selected, what are the relative amounts uh, in US dollar equivalent. And then in this particular dashboard, you can click on any one of these heat map cells, and it'll show you all underneath all the transactions that make up that uh, value there. So that ability to not just look at a balance number, but to drill down into the underlying transaction level is really critical. So I, uh, I can't uh, it reiterate that enough, that ability at the transaction level, and to see that uh, activity. So that's really from a bank perspective. This one, again, is looking uh, across all of our accounts. So when we look for certain transactions or somebody has an inquiry, we actually have a global search. So they, they can type in a, a customer name, a supplier name, or something in there, and it'll show you all the transactions that uh, meet that criteria. And so just be able to filter through and search across, literally for us, uh, hundreds of thousands of transactions. Another way, another spin on this is just looking at transaction counts by month and by account and really trying to identify low activity accounts, low usage accounts. You know, low usage accounts not only have a cost for the company and the organization, it could be a hard dollar cost in terms of monthly bank charges. Uh, there's a soft cost from a reconciliation and uh, audit uh, perspective. But it, not understanding your flows, your transaction flows, also can open you up to fraud, fraud uh, activity. So really understanding what's, what should be happening in your account uh, and looking for things that might be an outlier. Another spin on that first chart was, that first dashboard is, like I said, I'm old school cross-tab view. So looking at things like your balances by currency, by date, uh, in both account currency and US dollar equivalent. This is a variation that we also use. Um, if, you're fam if, you, if you're at all familiar with what's called the FBAR requirement for foreign bank account reporting requirement, it's a US IRS requ uh, requirement where you have to report all of your foreign bank accounts and the highest value that the account had within the calendar year and, and then have to convert that to US dollar equivalent. You actually have to do that conversion using foreign exchange rates provided by the IRS. So now we can actually take those rates, download them, bring them into our financial master warehouse in January, and then generate. Uh, we have a separate report that we're building out for our FBAR compliance. So it'll identify the highest balance that any of our foreign accounts had throughout the calendar year, and then we convert it to US dollar equivalent using those IRS rates, which are different than our accounting system rates. So another view of this is just uh, another kind of heat map here looking at separating transactions by credit and debit and then the transaction type. These particular transaction types are based on the BAI definition, uh, uh, which is a kind of a US standard uh, definition there, but seeing you know, what, are the, what are the flows going through there. The interesting aspect of all of this that I've been showing is really your data from a banking partner perspective. What is the bank telling you, that, and what is their definition of that data? So then the challenge is, what does that data mean to me and to our organization? So earlier this year, we actually started on a, uh, another uh, improvement in this process where we created data enrichment. So we created a process where we built a rule file and uh, we came up with a definition we call cash flow type and cash flow subtype. So we came up with about, I think we have 12 cash flow types, so accounts payable, accounts receivable, payroll, taxes, intra-company, inter-company, uh, investments, and a few other categories. And then there's about 150 cash flow subtypes. So when we look at, as an example, payroll, 
payroll. It could be regular payroll. It could be payroll tax, benefits, 401k funding, uh, other things that are related to payroll. So how do we be able to spin those? I wouldn't say spin it. How do we take that transaction-level data and put a definition around it to say, what does it mean for us and our business so that we can answer questions, manage our cash position, manage our cash forecast, answer questions when the CFO or a corporate controller have questions, say, what changed period over period in our cash balances? We can quickly say, what was that? Which subsidiary, which bank account, which currency, which country? Be able to answer those questions very quickly. So we came up with this kind of matrix, and then we started, and it's really actually pretty easy. Uh, going back to Excel, I'll tell you the secret sauce. We have used an Excel file right now to, to do this, but this will be updated to actually be a table in the database. And then we just build this rules that say, if it's this account number, it's this transaction code, and it has this narrative text, then assign it this, cash, this transaction, the cash flow type and cash flow subtype. And that's a six character combination there, and then it really uh, improved our reporting and analytics you know, by a multitude. So we have about 2,100 categorization rules, maybe 22, and it's something that we update uh, throughout the, the week as, as new transactions come in and they don't match an existing rule. We also, on those, um, that cash flow type subtype code, we actually put that on all of our payments that go out the door. So any of our manual payments, whether it's a wire, ACH payment, something that we're creating manually in the banking portal, we put that six character uh, code in that payment template so that when it comes back on the bank statement, it gets interpreted and then mapped accordingly. So we're just trying to enrich the data on the front end as it goes out and then we can look at things like totals, averages, high low trends, and then we'll be, uh, our next use case is to use that for forecasting. So now taking it to the next level, which is looking at a specific bank account here and then looking at, uh, in this case, the cash flow flows by cash flow type. We can see where we started the month at from an opening ledger perspective, and then what were the flows by cash flow type in both account currency and US dollar uh, equivalent using our accounting rates there. Uh, so it's really a, a way to take all that data and make sense of it from our business definition. And so again, helping us understand what are those flows, what are the attributes of them, and how do we give our management team insight into what's driving that. I'll pause there, I've been doing a lot of talking. I would never be a good professor because I lose my voice after about 30 minutes. So any uh, questions? Yes, sir. <laughs> um, you know, I, in, our, in our reporting, variance reports, that sort of thing, there's reason for things occurring in the week now. Is there any word to put commentary about the next week because of comments code in the So that's actually something that we're going to be exploring with some of the extensions that were brought in or that we're ta that talking about in some of the, in the product roadmap. And we're thinking about how do we actually use some of that new capability in Tableau to drive that commentary because right now what we do is at the end of the month we produce a, an email out to the management team and say this is where we started, this is where we ended, these were the key drivers, but we really want to try and drive that automation around that. Or I wouldn't say necessarily automation, but that, that insight so that we're not you know, uh, having to think about manual commentary as much. But yeah, that's where we want to use uh, some of those capabilities that Tableau has been talking about this week. Good question. The other, yes, sir, or yes, ma'am, sorry. So, great question. So, this is really looking at, you know, kind of bank statement transaction data. So, if we had something that was out of compliance, which I would just say we don't have, you know, really what you're looking for is potentially, you know, fraudulent activity. Um, we haven't ha identified anything like that yet, so we're pretty tight on around our cash management processes. We haven't, thankfully, had any fraud or issues around that. But what we have identified are things like where we've had balances and, and we're not earning any interest on those. And so we've been able to have discussions with our banking partners saying, hey, you know, the interest rate environment's changed. We notice you're not paying us anything on these balances. Let's have a discussion around this. And that's actually led to you know, hard dollar interest earnings for Tableau 
uh, which is you know, more than paid for all this development here. We actually, in one of our next examples, in a little bit on payments, we'll talk about uh, compliance and how we think about that. Any other questions? Okay. So this is another variation of that where we're just, in our filtering criteria up there, we can say show subtypes or hide subtypes. So we're just blowing out our subtypes here and saying, okay, what makes up AP? What are the different type of uh, subtypes or bank fees or um, intercompany activity in both account currency and uh, US dollar equivalent? So really, again, you know, this is super helpful. Maybe the question on compliance, you know, we can look at intercompany flows, cross-border flows, and we understand uh, all of that through just the use of the bank statement activity here. So we can see what were the currencies, what were the amounts, when did we make those payments, and just make sure that we're uh, compliant on some of those uh, attributes there. So one of the things that happens, too, is transactions are imported into the database. If they don't match them, uh, one of our categorization rules, then they end up as what's called undefined. So there's usually two or three undefined transactions a day, and then we have to manually uh, go through and update our uh, categorization rule file just to support that. So we can tell certain things as well, like in these uh, examples here, and that customer reference number, uh, which is about, what, five digits there, or actually eight digits, and a forward slash and another digit, that actually tells us that that uh, transaction emanated from our ERP system as a result of a payment file upload. So one of the things that we've developed, and we'll, uh, I don't have a screenshot of this, we'll talk about it in just a minute, how we take our payment files and bring those into a database, and then we're actually marrying them up with the bank statements to say, if we sent a payment file of 50 payments and 48 cleared the bank statement, which two didn't? So we're uh, doing an operational reconciliation there. So what's kind of next for us is there's a, we have a global treasury of really two, myself and Kelly, who's sitting in the back of the room here. So we've never, we always joke every day, there's never enough hours in the day to get it all done. Uh, and we actually have a, another team member who's transitioning to uh, uh, support us more on kind of analytics development. And we want to really build out this forecasting component, which is taking our uh, open AP invoices from our ERP and then our Coupa invoice capture system, uh, open AR invoices from our NetSuite uh, ERP, ca uh, cash flows from our investment uh, database, uh, foreign exchange trades, uh, which we do on the FX all trading platform, cash flows from e-commerce, corporate cards, payroll related data, uh, and PO purchase orders and sales orders and start bringing all that together in a uh, cash flow forecast, so we're actively working on that. The hard part, to your point earlier, is how do you kind of snapshot that forecast and then do variance analysis. So we're working with our teams on some ideas on how to do a kind of a daily or weekly snapshot of those forecasts, and then we can go do that historical variance analysis. All right, payments management. So this is something that uh, we've been, so our goal is that every payment where possible comes out of our ERP system, and we send it to the bank in this, all these acronyms. You can't be in the financial world without acronyms, especially if you deal with SWIFT, lots of acronyms. Uh, the PAIN, which stands for Payment Initiation, it's a global XML format, and really all that means is sending your payments with a bigger data payload uh, and pushing more data with that payment to support least cost routing. So processing payments is like ACH versus wire, uh, straight through processing, so you have all the data so that payments don't drop out for manual repair along the way, uh, making sure that you have all the required kind of KYC AML data around full beneficiary addressing, things like that. So our goal is every payment is coming out of our ERP in that format, and every payment gets a unique end-to-end -end ID number. Uh, so that allows you to tie the payment back to the payment record within the ERP system to the bank statement uh, and so forth, and be able to link all those things across uh, there. And so we want to minimize the manual payments that we're doing through uh, banking portals and then uh, provide as rich a data payload as possible, and then making sure our banking partners support what's called data overpopulation, meaning if we send them a 
payment instruction or payment file and we populate data that they don't need, they don't reject it. They just ignore that data if it's not needed in their systems and then really leverage those payment files for uh, analytics. So we just built this process to actually take in our payment files, pull them into our financial master database, and what we, can, what we do here, and we're kind of just built this a few weeks ago, but we can look at all of our payments that are an individual file, so I can select either an individual batch or payment date, and then look at different attributes of the payment to make sure that they have a valid SWIFT code, that we have a valid uh, country code, local clearing code. And now what we're thinking, working on, is how do we source some of this other supporting data, like the global SWIFT BIC directory, and then be able to link that back into here so that we can do a cross-check to say, now, I may be missing a SWIFT code, or I may have a SWIFT code, but is it truly valid? And so trying to identify those data anomalies and catch, uh, capture those. You can see where some of the things that are highlighted in yellow are data values that we're missing uh, or that are invalid. And so one of the things that's happening in the payments world uh, for compliance is having full beneficiary addressing. So just being able to just visually see that, now moving it to kind of automated alerting. So as things come in, identifying those that we have issues with. So payments is a really interesting space because it truly is all about data. And it's about having the right master data I know this is really small. We, uh, that's probably why I'm losing my vision here at Tableau. Uh, <laughs> we have a lot of things. We're trying to cram a lot of data into here. Uh, and we think about it in terms of, you know, kind of this integrity, making sure that we have all the right data in there to affect these, uh, these act transactions that we're working with and making sure that they're uh, compliant. So it's kind of just thinking through different use cases of that. That's at an individual payment level. This would be uh, payment history. So uh, actually one of the things that, if you're in the payments world, there's a lot of fraud that's out there. One of the uh, things that's happening now that has been written about is invoice hijacking. So uh, invoices from suppliers are being intercepted en route and the beneficiary bank data is being adjusted on those invoices uh, en route to the ultimate you know, customer. So one of the things that we do is as we pull this in, you can click through uh, and click on a payment and then see uh, down below all the prior payments that were sent to that beneficiary along with the data uh, that was used, so the beneficiary bank account, SWIFT code, local clearing code. And so telling us, okay, this payment here, because it's, we've done what, six, seven previous payments, a lot lower risk, nothing's changed, it's got a pretty low risk profile. I might click on another payment. It could be a first time we've sent that to that beneficiary. And so that may be something I want to do a little bit deeper dive and make sure I have supporting data around that. We're actually working on a different kind of a, a variation of this where we, instead of having to drill through each payment one by one, kind of bring that data up in, into more of a dashboard view to then highlight number of payments that this is a first time beneficiary or number, is this a payment, number of payments where the beneficiary account is different than the prior payment that was made. And so this is actually having to get a little bit smarter around compliance relative to what the ERP supports. So in the case of NetSuite, it doesn't capture historical data from a beneficiary bank perspective. So if, it, if our master data team changes something, it's not necessarily you know, coded in the history there that we can easily get to. So we're having to kind of be smarter about how we look at that. And this is a big deal because there's you know, payment fraud all over, all over the world. In fact, the SEC, I think, just published a notice a couple of weeks ago about you know, what are your controls around what they call uh, business email compromise scams, which historically have been you know, outright fraud where someone's spoofing or uh, sending a phishing email to trick somebody into doing a payment, but now it's actually moving down into this kind of invoice level. And so you know, we're just trying to be ahead of that and think how do, we, how do we manage the compliance around this. And then taking this data at a summary level to update our cash position. So looking at all the batches that we're processing, what are the totals around that, and then feeding that into our forecast. So when we do a payment run, feeding that into our short-term cash forecast to say, you know, we're expecting 
this number of payments for this total amount to be debited tomorrow or the next day or whatever the applicable value date is out there on the payment batch. So lest you think we look at everything in grid or cross-tab format, which I assure you we do a lot, but we're also trying to get better at visualization. So we started playing around with the payments data and came up with our first Treasury Sankey diagram, uh, which is really just showing kind of relative flows of payments from the different countries that we hold, which is really our subsidiaries that we have uh, bank accounts in, and what are the value of those payments represented by the width of the flow swim lane to what countries are there, uh, those payments going to. So trying to understand our payment corridors and you know number of payments that are in, we're looking at variations of this, number of payments that are in a currency other than the bank account currency that we're originating the payment out of, or number of payments that are in a currency other than the traditional local currency of the beneficiary country, and just trying to get smarter around cross-border payments, which is also leads into your foreign exchange exposure, because this is, uh, these are, it, it, when you have payments that are in a currency other than the functional currency of the legal entity, then that's a foreign exchange exposure on your balance sheet. So just trying to get kind of smarter about that and just playing around with the data and saying, what is this telling us and how do we think about it? What can we adjust in our processes? So kind of next for us is transmitting our payment files over the SWIFT File Act service. Uh, when you do that, depending on your banking partner, you can get another set of data coming back to you, which are called your payment status reports, which tell you what's happening to that payment at your originating bank. And so there's various uh, levels of detail around that, but we, we want that detail coming back to us so we can correlate it. And so if we send a payment file with 50 payments in it and the bank processes 48 and rejects two, we want to identify those two rejections and not have to find it on the bank statement afterwards that they didn't clear, but find out that they were kind of kicked out. Uh, and then the next thing is uh, if you follow the SWIFT world at all, they have a service called GPI, which is essentially a real-time tracking service of cross-border payments. So we want to link all of our cross-border payment activity to that SWIFT GPI tracking service to then have a real-time uh, view of all of our payments and where they're at in their life cycle as they move through the system. So we spend a lot of time with suppliers who email us saying, have you made my payment? Have you pay me, paid me yet? And it, that takes, someone has to look at that email, go process that, you know, and then start researching it. And so if we have sent a payment, we want to be able to see that in real time. And then we're thinking about how do we actually push that back into some of our other tools, all that status data, to give the beneficiary of that payment uh, insight into what's happening. Uh, so that's something that we're looking at there. So just trying to different use cases of that data. And then again, mentioning the SWIFT reference data and how we think about BIC codes, intermediary uh, SWIFT codes, local clearing codes, things that allow payments to move uh, more um, automated through the system at least cost uh, to us and uh, straight through. I'll stop there for a minute. Any questions on the riveting world of payments? And it's a lot about data. There's, it's a, probably about the lowest level of data you can get into is, is payments. I can tell it's very exciting on a uh, Wednesday afternoon. <laughs> So a couple of other use cases here. We talked about uh, corporate cards. So we uh, are responsible for Tableau's corporate card program. So we're kind of thinking about this um, in some different use cases and getting data. And so one of the things we worked with our provider on is getting an end of day file of all of our cards, the limit on each card, and then the balance. And then, uh, and then we're looking for things like understand what the limit is, how many number of cards that are in different groupings of limits, what the outstanding balance is. We actually aggregate that outstanding balance because that changes every day, and then we can use that to forecast into our, what the settlement is gonna be at the end of the following month. So in the card program, you basically your cycle is the first day of the month to the last calendar day of the month, and then you have a settlement at some point in the following month. So being able to kind of manage all those attributes around that. One of the other things that we used to do is quarterly, we would take an extract report uh, from the card management portal and we'd tick and tie that against all the, our global HR directory to make sure that 
you know, every card that we had issued out there was mapped to a, a valid uh, employee. So that done was done on a quarterly basis. Now we actually do it on a daily basis. So we actually can bump up, you know, I actually have that in the next slide here, but this is showing all of our cards, uh, the different card program, the limits, and then we have it sorted by the limit, and then uh, the balance and some other attributes. So just seeing, you know, looking for things like, do we have users whose balance are within 75% of their limit? So that may be, we might reach out to them and say, hey, you know, you're approaching your limit, do you need a short-term increase? Because again, this is financial risk, right? There's, if there's fraud on the card, then it takes, even though we have li you know, liability protection, fraud protection on the program, that takes a lot of time to work with your provider on that. So we're trying to kind of winnow that opportunity for fraud down and, and you know, mitigate it by only providing limits that are appropriate for the activity and for that employee. And so you know, we're just trying to you know, actively manage that and reduce that fraud window. So this would be, as an example, this is our uh, daily email that comes out and tells us all the cards that don't map to a valid email address. And most of these cards are um, what we would call ghost cards, so they're used for a central travel program. But if an employee has a card and the HR team has input a uh, end date or termination date for that employee, it'll show up on this exception report every day. What that allows us to do is a couple of different workflow items, reach out to that employee and their manager to make sure that all their card transactions are reconciled before they separate from Tableau. And because when we find out after the fact, it's literally five times the amount of work to go after the fact and, and take care of those transactions. So we can manage that on the front side. We can also confirm when we should actually end date the card so that when the employee on their last day, we can shut off the card and reduce our potential for fraud. So this happens every day automatically. So instead of once a quarter, manual reconciliation, daily automated uh, against our global HR directory. And then just monitoring uh, credit limits and ratios uh, on the card, uh, the balance versus the limit, and so we can take care of uh, things uh, and have discussions with employees and so maybe they need a temporary limit increase like for this week, there's a lot of activity going on with a lot of our team members down here. So we wanna make sure that we're uh, handling that uh, you know, as best as possible. Those are a couple of items on cards. And maybe we'll kick into some treasury trends to watch. So you know, some of the biggest changes going on in the financial banking landscape is the use of APIs. So every financial institution out there is investing heavily in APIs for transaction management, uh, reporting, you know, bank statement, bank transaction reporting, payment status reporting, market data. So thinking about, okay, how do we start tapping into some of those APIs and, and pulling that into our analysis, our workflows? Uh, and so we're, we're actually working on a project to pull uh, market data through APIs into Tableau uh, from a couple of our different banking partners. So um, allowing us to do different modeling of that with that data. And next item that's a big change out there, payment systems changes. So I mentioned this really fun acronym of ISO 2022 XML, which is just an XML format for communication of payments, statement reporting, trade confirmations. There's a whole host, there's a whole uh, if you're interested and like to geek out on this stuff like I do, because I'm always trying to figure out how do we use, uh, get more data and do something with it, there's a, a website, iso2022.org. But the important thing is, is that a lot of the payment clearing systems around the world are moving to this format. So the US Fedwire is moving to this in 2021, 2022. And so that, what that means is bigger data payloads going with each payment instruction as it goes through the clearing systems, whether it's Fedwire, or the US uh, ACH system, the Canadian uh, equivalent of Fedwire, the UK. And so that just means you're gonna have to provide more data. So that means you gotta manage that data up front, capture it, make sure it's correct, garbage in, garbage out, uh, and you wanna avoid that. But then you have more data coming back on your statement reporting and can actually do drive more analytics around that. So that's a big change going on around the world. And there's things out there, regulatory changes, like in Europe they had 
uh, recently uh, come up with uh, what's called PSD2, which is this concept of open banking. And then, you know, things that are changing out there for the use of blockchain or distributed ledger. And it's reusing some of those things that we're seeing out there are reusing a lot of these same data elements. Never ending security and compliance, uh, fraud prevention. So bigger data payloads, oftentimes driven by regulatory requirements. So it used to be you could make a payment, all you needed was a beneficiary account number and a swift bit code. Now you actually have to have full beneficiary addressing, uh, qualified addressing, postal code, city, street address, a lot of countries that you make payments into. You actually have to have a purpose code, so when you're going into some of the emerging market or controlled currency countries like India or China or South Africa, you actually have to have a purpose code in there. So how do you populate all that? Make sure that uh, you're providing your beneficiary as much in re uh, remittance data as possible so they understand when they get the payment how to apply it and work with it. So there's just a lot of things that are going on there. And then how do you use that for fraud pre prevention? We're also seeing the, um, I would say, quick expansion of real-time payments. In the payments world, everything used to be kind of batch-oriented, except for the real-time, like, Fedwire payments. Now the U.S. has real-time payments. Australia's got real-time payments, the U.K. So payments are moving faster, more quickly, and so you have to be thinking about how am I going to manage fraud, how am I going to manage compliance. And again, all of that revolves around data and your processes. And then we think about just big data uh, and analytics. So more and more data being created every day. And think about what's hidden in your data. What are the questions that you have? What do you want to answer? What do you want to know? Uh, we have an interesting use case that we're looking at just on bank statements and taking when we have transactions in a currency other than the bank account currency, there's an embedded foreign exchange spot transaction that occurs there. How can we break that out into its component parts of the uh, transaction currency code, the amount and the rate, and then how can we compare that for benchmarking purposes? So thing, or, and how can we break those components out for rec more importantly for reconciliation into our ERP system? So a couple of key items here. I, I really think of Tableau as a platform. So how we, you know, just playing with it, being able to explore your data, ask questions, and it's not just I want to create a visualization or dashboard, but how can I really go start answer, asking questions and getting answers? How can I drive insight for that? How can I connect to multiple data sources? And I mentioned this earlier. In my experience, having implemented a number of treasury management systems, the biggest cost component of that was data integration, taking data out of an ERP system or a planning system or some other system and having to shoehorn that into the treasury system or to some other system and losing data along the way. I have a data extract that's got 50 columns of data, but the system I need to get it into has only got room for 10 columns. I gotta chop off everything, so I'm never quite happy with that. And that's very costly to do that type of development and maintain it. How can I use Tableau to pull through what I need and still allow me the ability to drill down to that underlying transaction level? Talking about flexible workflows. A lot of legacy systems force users into fixed workflows uh, and static reporting. So we really, I th really think about Tableau as allowing flexible workflows and kind of user-defined um, exploration of their data and driving outcomes around that. And then transaction level data is key. This was actually really important, not only here at Tableau, but my prior company where I was responsible for their glo global foreign exchange management, we would get these really wacky revaluations happening on different balance sheet accounts in the ledger. And we struggled to understand what was driving that. And it was invariably journal entries posted to the GL at an inverted FX rate. And so they would get posted in, this, in the ERP and the only way to, you could really identify that it was to get an extract of all the journal entries and then look for those things at an inverted rate. And by being able to, you know, that's an example of if I had that transaction level detail at my fingertips, I could put processes around that to help prevent that. Uh, and so that, you can always roll everything up, which is great. Tableau is great for 
uh, aggregating and rolling data up. But when you're starting with summary data, it's really hard to break it back down. And so that's why I really think about uh, that transaction level data. And just removing uh, friction for your users, finding additional uses uh, of your data. We're always finding different use cases for that data all the time, whether it's on the payment side, the statement side, foreign exchange trades, investments, we're always finding uh, new use cases, which is really fun because uh, as our CFO says, we have the treasury science projects back here in the corner. They're always kind of working on different things and different uh, ideas around that. Uh, so that's uh, pretty fun to be able to do that. A couple of other items. We did a webinar that's available on tableau.com back in the end, I think it was the end of May, about how we're uh, doing cash flow analysis. Because a lot of this is the same slides uh, that we went through today are in that webinar. Uh, we have a blog that we had published. And then I think, you know, one of the big highlights for us this year, there's a publication out of London called Treasury Today uh, magazine. And they have an annual uh, awards for best in class uh, treasury processes or best in class uh, treasury groups at different companies. And uh, we actually won the uh, 2018 Adam Smith Award for uh, the category of harnessing the power of technology. So how we take kind of all this data, bring it in natively, enrich it, sit Tableau on top and drive uh, reporting and analytics around that. So that was uh, great, I think, recognition for Tableau and, and some of the things that we've done there. All right, so before I run out of time today and run out of my voice, uh, I just ask everyone to, if, uh, if you thought this was helpful, uh, or even if you didn't think it was helpful, please give us feedback in completing the uh, survey uh, uh, and evaluation in your uh, mobile app. We'd really appreciate that. Hopefully I'll get invited back next year to talk about this riveting topic again. Uh, so it's something that I really enjoy. Uh, it's a fun space to be in. I hope it was beneficial to you. Uh, just trying to give you some ideas and think, some takeaways to take back to your company and look at using Tableau in new and unique ways. So, any questions before everybody runs out? Yes, sir? Yeah, I would, I would say we deal with things like um, mi you know, missing data, right? So the requirement is an example on payments and beneficiary address. We may not have captured that for some of our early suppliers, that address. So we're actually on the end of that process where we're trying to affect something that another prior process didn't capture from years ago. So we're probably more on kind of the end of that. But what we want to do is make sure that all of our teams across the company are using the same data sources. So like, just going back to bank statement data, we want all of our team members that have a need for that data to use that common source. And that's why we're putting some of these kind of monitoring integrity checking around that data. We've also come up with ideas. So one of the things that we want to work on is building out what I would call a subsidiary entity data management structure because we, Treasury has data on all of our subs, our legal group has data, our tax group, FP&A, and so they're all, there's some level of overlap, and then oftentimes we need data from other groups, and we wanna get all of that brought together so that you know, we're not reinventing the wheel or having multiple versions of the truth out there. And so those are things that we look for, that type of commonality, of what I would just call master data, metadata, whether it's subsidiaries or suppliers or customers, and, and making sure we're you know, trying to think about that the right way and organize it. I don't know if that really answered your question there. Yeah, yeah, when you think about all of our subsidiaries, right? When you think, and this is really important for the treasury function because of this kind of KYC requirements, AML, uh, and all these different attributes that we have to have around tax ID numbers, registration numbers, operating address, registered address. I mean, there's just, who knows what's gonna be asked for, so how do we, get everybody working on the same definition of that data. Any other questions? Yes, sir. For uh, like the future cash position, like how do you handle it? Like do you have financial obligations, like uh, tax payments for different countries in the context of like credit card transactions mm -hmm. all over the world? So we have like regular payments, we have to do something in the future. And how would we incorporate this in a system like Tableau Thank you. 
That's correct, yeah. So it's, it's a great, that's a good question. So I think about it in kind of several different kind of ways there. One is sourcing data that's sitting in existing systems like an ERP for known liabilities, known future payments, so open AP invoices, uh, maybe uh, open cash, future cash flows from our investments. If it's something that doesn't exist yet as a liability on the system, I know that it's there, but it's not yet recorded as an actual transaction, then I have to figure out how to get that into our system. And especially things that are on a recurring basis. So pay, like future payroll, next month's payroll at the different subsidiaries doesn't yet exist as a data element anywhere. And so we're working with our payroll team to actually capture that and then refresh it periodically so that all feeds into the forecast. So there's not a really a good answer. It's, you gotta capture it somewhere and then kind of refresh your uh, Tableau workbook as it were. And to the earlier point I was making, how do you think about snapshotting that? So what I know today is my future cash flows is gonna be different than what I know that's coming Friday for future cash flows. And so thinking about snapshot, capturing that data. So I think you just have to figure out what's gonna work for your organization. Yeah. We have it in Excel, so I have like a tool that like for every bank account we can like see along the line uh, like the future obligations. So yeah. then I have a system like a matrix where I can move around the cash between the accounts. Yep. But then in Excel it's easy. Like I, I erase, I have like somebody like taking say the erase income for cash is just in the figures that I erase. But then with Tableau. Yeah. In the future estimates, I mean, which is something that is just an estimate, right? So I'm like, it's not gonna be exact, but it's gonna give me an idea about like the position in the future, how it's gonna be. And then this kind of process of uploading and updating data in a separate table that is uh, incorporates each application is gonna be a little bit uh, awkward. Yeah, because you essentially have to refresh your workbook from that so Excel file. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the reality is we're kind of doing the same thing in our cash, short-term cash forecast right now as we drive to automation where we're pulling future value-dated transactions from the ERP system then and, you know, it, and pulling that into our Tableau workbooks. You know, we're, we're gonna get to that, but it takes a while to kind of work through that. It, you know, Excel, for that type of forecasting, it's just quick and easy. Uh, what, you know, Tableau is just allowing us to do it in kind of a, a different way. Yep. Yeah, because Tableau is read-only, so it's only gonna read the source data, so you can't put together your cash position, your cash forecast, and then move things around, and say, well, I'm gonna have this happen here, or I know that this is gonna flow through here. You, you can't really do that in Tableau, uh, and unless you go through the effort to kind of do write-backs to your data source, which I'm not as, as strong and, and versant in that capability. So I wish I had a better answer for you. <laughs> You bet. Any other questions? Well, thank you everyone for coming and coming all the way to the end of the building. So thank you.